Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Timur Dumler, um, also known as Timur Audio on Twitter. I am developer advocate at JetBrains. We make developer products such as the C-Line IDE and the ReSharper Visual Studio plugin and other stuff. Um, welcome to my talk. He started six minutes late, so you're probably gonna finish six minutes late as well, so apologies for that. And we're gonna talk about C++ 23. And uh, one thing that happened just one month ago is that C++ 23 is now feature complete. Okay, so it's not done done yet, okay? So we still have half a year to fix bugs. We call this ballot resolution in, in ISO language. So there's two more committee meetings where we can do these bug fixes. I don't expect anything dramatic to happen there. Uh, so we basically know the feature set of C++ 23 already, even though it's not an officially published standard yet. Uh, so it's a great time to talk about it. Um, developing C++ 23 felt actually quite different from developing C++ 20 or C++ 17 because of obviously the pandemic. Uh, all of the development of C++ 23 happened remotely. Uh, we didn't have any in-person committee meetings since February 2020. So I think this is part of the reason why uh, we didn't get everything into the standard that we originally wanted to. So we didn't get executives, we didn't get networking, we didn't get pattern matching, we didn't get contracts. So you might think it's bad news, but the good news is that I think that given the circumstances, the committee has done a really, really good job and we have uh, got a lot of really good stuff into the new standard. So um, yeah, there's, there's some really, really good stuff in there. And as I was preparing this talk, I was thinking, Hmm, so which of these should I talk about? And um, so I did a talk about C++ 20 uh, a couple of years ago, uh, and I shamelessly stole the title from that talk for this talk, so it's the same title, except now it's C++ 23. But in the C++ 20 talk, um, I was talking basically about these four big features of C++ 20, right? Coroutines, concepts, ranges, and modules. And these four features, they change the way we write code and we think about code and we learn how to do things in code in very significant ways, right? Because they change the way we think about functions, the way we think about templates, the way we think about algorithms, and the way we think about compiling and packaging and distributing our code, right? So these are extremely fundamental things. Um, and I spoke about in that talk, um, and C++23, by comparison, is a much smaller release, right? So we don't have these features that kind of change everything. Um, but I would argue that it still has quite a few uh, like features that are very significant. And the way I see kind of C++ is it's like a really large toolbox, right? So you have saws, you have chisels, you have screwdrivers. And if you look at the screwdrivers, maybe you have Phillips screwdrivers and Torx screwdrivers and, and then someone invents a pentalobe screwdriver, right? So they're great for having a very particular problem with a very particular product. And it's good if you, if you need that, you will reach for that. And I would argue that most of the kind of new features are like this. They're like very specialized tools that you need for like one particular problem. Um, but then there's also other kinds of features which are more like uh, the introduction of the cordless electric screwdriver, right? So it doesn't matter what kind of screw you want to turn, you don't have to do it by hand anymore, you can just do bzzz, right? And it becomes a two second job. And if you work with screws a lot, that's kind of a game changer. And I'm looking for these kinds of features more than the kind of specialized things that do only one thing. Um, and those are the features I'm interested in. And arguably we do have a few things like this in C++23. So we need to uh, look at which ones are these, and again, like I did in the other talk, I wanna pick four. So here's a page on CPP reference, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, which lists basically w what features of C++ 17, 2023, like is supported by which compiler. So there's like this big table here, and the um, rows are the different features. And so this also serves as a very good list of all the things that are now in the C++23 committee draft. So these are just the rows and every row is a feature, right? So we first have a long table of core language features and it kind of goes on and on. And then we have an even longer list of um, library features, right? So these are all the standard library features that we voted into C++23 that are now part of C++23. And if you zoom out, you see it's quite a long list. And so again, you know, on the leftmost column, you see this is just a list of features. And actually, uh, almost half of those we approved only 
just at the last committee meeting, which happened virtually on Zoom um, at the end of July. So that was six weeks ago or something like that, right? So, so the leftmost column, that's all the new stuff in C++23. Um, and let me just extract all of that into one slide, except it actually doesn't fit on one slide. So we have one slide just with the new kind of core language features, or like core language changes, and then we have two slides with standard library changes, right? So it's like three slides full of stuff. So I need to kind of whittle this down a little bit. So, uh, you know, because obviously we can't talk about all of this in one hour. Uh, so I went ahead and removed kind of all the defect reports, deprecations, undeprecations, clarifications. There's a lot of stuff where make something const expert, make something no except, add a new constructor here, you know, stuff like that. So we're not gonna talk about any of this. And then um, there's another big topic, which is um, character encoding. A lot of work has been done on that, uh, which again, I'm not gonna talk about here because um, there are other people who can do that much better than I do. And then there's another huge topic, which is ranges. And there have been lots of additions to ranges in C++23. But again, first, arguably, it's kind of not something completely new, but it's just something, making something better that we already have since C++20. And again, also, there are other people who are much better suited to give a talk about all the new ranges stuff than I am. So I'm gonna omit all the ranges stuff, um, because that's another talk. And actually, I'm gonna throw out everything else that is also somehow an addition of an existing feature, or an improvement on, of an existing feature, rather than a completely new feature in its own right. And if I remove all of those things, I end up with just one slide, which now has uh, language and library features. And this is the list of the things that are really brand new features in their own right in C++23. And so we can consider talking about all of those. Some of them are relatively small, relatively self-contained, and, and relatively specialized. Uh, so they're more like the pentalobe screwdriver, yes? Kind of specialized tool that you're gonna use when you need to solve that particular problem. And as I said, I don't wanna really talk about that. I wanna talk about the, the kind of bigger, really impactful features. So I'll remove all of the things that I think are kind of a little bit too kind of specialized, and then I end up with this list. And this is kind of the meat. These are like the big fe new features in C++23. And so this is still a little bit too long of a list. So I would say these two, they're cool, but arguably it's just finishing work that we have started in C++20, right? So you can now import the standard library as a module, modules we had since C++20, and there's now some rudimentary library support for coroutines, which is something that we should have had in C++20, but we just didn't get that in in time. So it's kind of complementing something that we should have done in 20 already. So I'm not gonna talk about that. And then there's these four, and they're great additions to the standard library. So they're very, very useful. They have a stack trace library. We have move only function, which I think had lots of names when we settled on that one eventually. And then we have flat map and flat set, you know, which are great for kind of cache friendly um, computing. And so if you need those things, you will use them. You will find them, you will reach for them, and they're great libraries. But again, they're kind of self-contained. They're maybe not small, but they're self-contained. It's like this functionality, if you need it, you're gonna use it. And they don't, kind of touch stuff around them, right? They don't touch like other parts of the language. So they're great, they do their job, but they don't, they're not gonna change the way we think about C++, the way we think about code and software design and how we go about you know, designing something or solving a problem or learning or teaching C++. They're just kind of more tools in our toolbox. So I'm gonna remove those and that leaves us with these four. And that's what the rest of the talk is gonna be about. These four, these four features. And I believe these are the cross-cutting C++ 23 features that every C++ developer should be aware of. And those four, I think, are the ones that will have the biggest impact how we think about C++, how we write C++, and how we teach and how we learn C++. So yeah, these are the four, and let's start with the first one. Um, this is deduced, it's called deducing this. And this is by far the most significant core language feature in C++23. So it's not like modules which changes like the entire ecosystem. You can certainly write C++ code without knowing about deducing this, but it's surprising how many consequences the addition of this feature actually has. So it's, it's really worth kind of diving a little bit deeper and talking, talking about this. So this is the front page of the paper, like the proposal that we voted into the standard. Um, it has four authors, Gaspar Asman, Cy Brand, Ben Dean, and Barry Revson. According to Ben Dean, who's one of the authors, 
this feature has been kind of gestating since around 2013, and then different people have done different work, and then they kind of merged that, and, and this came out. It's been through quite a few revisions. And uh, Ben Dean himself actually gave this talk uh, last year at CppCon, uh, which is an hour just about deducing this. So if you want to know all the details, I recommend you watch this talk. Uh, this is right now, as far as I know, the ultimate reference on deducing this. So obviously I can't cover all of that, but I'm just going gi to like, give you the, the kind of minimal amount of information that you really need to know about this feature. And this brings me to a quote, which I'm not sure who exactly said this. I think it was Bjarne, um, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, and it's about um, the question, when is a proposal so good that it's worth you know, putting it into the standard, which obviously is going to affect millions of COSF developers worldwide. Um, and the bar for that is quite high, and, and one kind of criterion, it's not an official criterion by any means, but it's you know, something that somebody said is that a proposal is a really good feature if it solves three seemingly unrelated problems at the same time. I think that's a pretty cool property to have for good new language feature, and I think using this is, uh, is one of those. It does exactly this. So what's deducing this? Um, as you probably know, in C++ when you have a class, uh, we can overload member functions on whether or not the object is const, right? So we add const to the end of the declaration, and it means that this is going to be the overload that's going to be called if this, like the actual object itself, is const, right? Um, then somewhat lesser known, but still hopefully relatively well known, is the fact that since C++11, we can also overload on whether the this object is an L value or an R value. So for that, you use these ref qualifiers. You can add at the end ref or ref ref. And depending on whether you know, the object is an L value or an R value, it's going to call the L value reference overload or the R value reference overload on it. And so these are kind of the ref qualifiers that you add. And then you can also combine them, and you can have kind of this combination of overloads for all the different combinations of const, non-const, ref, and ref, ref, right? And so the first thing that deducing this does, it, it gives us basically a new syntax to write the same thing. So this syntax is kind of odd, right? Because the, 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 this pointer is like this implicit first argument of a function call, right? But uh, we specify whether it's const or whether it's ref with these weird kind of specifiers at the end. And so what deducing this lets you do is it lets you instead write this first argument ex explicitly. So it becomes really the first argument in the parameter, so sorry, the first parameter in the parameter declaration. And you mark it with the keyword this, which precedes everything else, and then you declare the parameter. And uh, there you can just say, okay, this needs to be a reference or an R value reference or const or non-const, right? So we have this new syntax here. Um, to do this, and so now this parameter becomes explicit rather than implicit. But it's, it's really exactly the same thing, right? It's just a different syntax uh, uh, to write the same thing. So instead of these weird qualifiers at the end, we say this, and then declare the first parameter, and it's gonna be the this pointer, and then we can slap those things there with the usual parameter declaration syntax. So hopefully that makes sense to everybody. And since it's just a parameter declaration, we can also obviously name it, we can, do whatever name you want. I just put self there because it's kind of cool if you are doing Python, but you don't have to do self. I think it's a good convention. Um, but then it gets more interesting because if you can do that, you can also template on whether what type it is. So you can write this whole thing as a template, and now it's a template on whether it's ref or ref ref or const or non-const. And if you then call the member function and, and pass this implicit this pointer as a, as a parameter, as an argument to it, uh, it's going to deduce what type it is and whether it's const or whether it's non-const using the normal rules of template argument deduction that we had since, you know, before C++ was standardized in the 90s. Um, so it's going to use the usual rules of function template argument deduction to figure out what type this is and whether it's const or non-const or whatever. Um, and you can also use this short syntax here, which hopefully is also not surprising. It's the same thing, you just use auto. And being able to do this solves a whole bunch of problems and it opens up quite a lot of new possibilities. Um, one of those is duplication, or rather quadruplication. 
So one problem that comes up in real life when you uh, write generic code is that you actually have to write out these, all these overloads in C++ 20 and before. For example, here, if we implement something like std optional value, right, so uh, we have to implement all these four overloads, right? So because depending on whether or not the optional is an R value, an L value, a const, or non-const, these functions need to return different types, right? But the annoying thing is that the body of the function is pretty much the same. So you're stamping out the same code four times, which is you know, not a good thing to do. Um, and, and unfortunately, there is, isn't a good workaround for this before C++23. So you can write this. You can write the same stuff four times. Uh, hopefully, you get it right. Um, you can also say, OK, one of these four overloads is going to be the actual function, and then the other three are kind of going to refer to it. But because the uh, argument types don't match and the return types don't match, you have to do these ugly casts, and it just really doesn't look great. Or you can say, OK, we're going to extract this into a private member function, and that's going to have the implementation, and then the four overloads are going to refer to that one. But then again, it's just a lot of boilerplate, right? And so with deducing this, we don't have to do any of that anymore. We can just write exactly one version, and gonna, we can template it on what this is, and now we cover all of the options, and we have to write the code only once. We don't have to write multiple overloads anymore. We have to just write the function once. It's now a function template, and it just does the right thing. So it's a lot less code, and also it's a lot um, you know, less error prone because it's less code. And the other thing is um, you can't make the other mistake where um, sometimes people just forget to write one of those four overloads, or two, or three, and then you, like everything compiles and works, but you're gonna make unnecessary copies, or you know you're not gonna you're gonna lose cont correctness, and so this is also not good. And so, if you template it like that, then you know you can be sure that all the possibilities are covered because it's a template. Right? So the second problem that deducing this. Um, by the way, if you have any questions, like if I'm going too fast, you can interrupt me and like raise your hand. Okay, we we're good. Okay, I hope you're all with me. Um, uh, the second problem that you're using this solves is uh, the curiously recurring template pattern. And uh, this is um, an example how a new feature can affect the way we learn C++. So here is, um, this is something where I want to do like a little bit of a personal story. Um, this is me um, many, many years ago. That was before I was a C++ developer. At the time I was working um, at the Astrophysical Institute Potsdam in Germany, so I was doing astrophysics research. And then at this point in my life, I was like, OK, I want to get out of academia. I want to become a C++ developer because it's cool. Um, and I wanted to get a job as a C++ developer. But because I was you know, doing kind of academic stuff and the, the, the way I was writing code there, I had some very basic knowledge of C++, but it was basically C with classes. I didn't really know how to write C++ in like a proper professional setting, right? because none of the people around me were professional software engineers, so there wasn't really any way I could have learned this. And so I landed myself a job interview, and I was like, okay, I need to actually prepare for this job interview. I need to show them that I actually know some C++. So how do I do that? Uh, so I read two things. I read um, Scott Meyer's Effective C++, which is a great book. Um, and then the other thing was this like weird website, uh, which was called C++ Idioms. And somebody told me, uh, I think it's still around, like as a, as a wiki or something. Um, and somebody told me, yeah, these are the things that you really need to know. Like, if you don't know these idioms, like you're not going to pass the interview. And I looked at the stuff, and none of it made any sense to me. It had like stuff like the pimple idiom, the erase remove idiom, and then CITP. I was like, what the hell is that? Um, so that made it quite difficult. Um, to learn. I, I got through these things. None of them were actually asked in the interview in the end, and I got the job. But um, like some of these things are kind of unintuitive, right? They're kind of not the way you would normally think you would do something. The erase remove idiom is a good example, and we actually got rid of that in C20. Now we have std erase that takes a vector, so we never have to write erase remove again. And CITP is another one of these, which is a clever solution to a problem, but it's kind of not obvious. Um, CRTP is very much still a thing. It's used in a standard library itself. For example, std enable shared from this is a classic example of a user interface that relies on CRTP. So I'm going to quickly um, 
show you what the classic CRTP looks like. This is a kind of a toy example, but it uses the same machinery as you know, real world use cases. So the idea is that we have, uh, we can have a base class which has some common uh, behavior uh, and then we can kind of inherit from that, but we don't want to pay and we want, we want the, the kind of derived classes to, you want, you want kind of to call derived classes from the base class but we don't want to pay for virtual function dispatch and, and all of that stuff, right? So you want to do it at compile time. You don't want to pay for the additional indirection of virtual functions. So we have this base class, and this is like stuff from the 90s, right? So this is, we have a base class, and now we do this weird thing where we template the base class on the derived class. So we template it on the class that is going to be, that, that's going to be deriving from it. And then uh, in the derived classes, so now we have cat and dog, uh, we are inheriting from the base class, which is animal, and then we are passing ourselves as a template parameter to the base class. Right? So this is, this is the CRTP pattern. And in the base class, we have to do this weird incantation where we have to do the static cast to derived because um, the base class doesn't know what derived is at this point. It's a template, right? Yes, yes, yes. There was an error here. So. First, the first problem with this code is that all of this is not obvious. Like, I could never remember, like, do I template the base class and the derived class, or do I template the derived class and the base class? And it just kind of wasn't very intuitive. There's more problems here. One of those is there's a bug on this slide. Where's the bug? Yes. So this happens when you copy paste code. The problem with this is yes, it's wrong, but it's going to compile. Right? It's going to compile and it's going to do something, but probably not what you wanted because it's undefined behavior. And there's no, the compiler is not going to check that for you. So this is kind of some of the, some of the issues with, C, with CRTP. Now if you fix that, we have another issue, which is cat and dog now actually have different base classes, right? So it, it also makes things a little bit more difficult if you want to do generic programming with this. So CRTP is clever, but it's kind of painful and non-obvious. And the nice thing is that by deducing this, it becomes a lot simpler. So with deducing this, we can now write it like that. Right? So we can, uh, if you want to access the derived class in the base class, we can take, again, the this parameter itself explicitly. And now we don't have to do this weird static cast incantation anymore. We can just write, well, just call, call the function, right? Because deducing this is going to deduce the most derived statically known type, right? So if you do this and the compiler knows that the object is actually a cat, because it's a function template, this autoref self, the type of this, is actually going to be cat. It's not going to be animal, right? This is really, really important. Because the compiler knows at compile time it's a cat, so that's what template argument deduction is going to deduct, deduce for you. So you don't need to cast anymore. And turns out you don't need to templates anymore either, right? So you don't need to do any of this stuff. You don't need to template on the base uh, template the base class and the derived class anymore. We don't. None of the classes are, are templates. This all just kind of goes away. And we we left with this we left with this much much simpler code. We don't need any curious recursion or templates or anything. We just write, hey, you know, take the actual class, which is going to be cat or dog and just call this method on it, right? And then the compiler is going to deduce, deduce that for us. So deducing this makes CRTP kind of obsolete. You can have more fun with this. For example, you can introduce this concept. You can say, well, uh, it's a speaking animal if it, if it implements you know, this, this function. And then you can have um, you know, your um, base class. And then you can say, um, you can constrain it on this template, right? So you just slap this in front of the first parameter, and everything else is just the same syntax as always. So now you can say, well, now it has to be um, you know, a speaking animal. And you can still make an animal that's not speaking and, and instantiate it, but if you then call the speak function, you're going to get a compile error, and the compiler error is going to say, class fish doesn't satisfy this constraint, right? So what we're doing here is really interesting. We're constraining a member function on the properties of the class itself that it's a member function of. Okay? And by that, I mean not the class animal, but where the member function is defined, but actually the actual derived type. Like, 
if it's known at compile time, right? Because it has to be known at compile time somehow. But if the compiler sees the actual type, this is what you're going to get. And uh, you can constrain on that. So that's really cool, and that's something that you couldn't do before in C++. There's a lot more you can do with using this. So you can, for example, pass um, self by value instead of by reference, uh, which is really cool. You can, it's really cool if you do like a builder pattern. You can have a chain of like objects passed by value. And um, so I'm not, I don't have time to talk about that. Yes, there's a question. Yeah. yeah. Which one? This one. So the question was, what happens if you have a vector of animals? And unfortunately, this is not virtual function dispatch. It's not runtime polymorphism. So you don't get this behavior. If you want to have a vector of animals, you need runtime polymorphism. So you need to have virtual function, uh, virtual functions. This is, not, this is not what CRTP is for. CRTP is for cases where it's compile time polymorphism. So here, we're instantiating a cat. So, so the compiler knows it's a cat. No, you will get a compiler error because it's not going to know that. Right. Uh, the third problem that you think that this solves is uh, recursive lambdas. And this is a really fun one. Let's think about how we would. I don't think we have too much time for questions. Is it a, is it a quick one? Yeah. If you downcast is cast to derived. Well, if you do not do cast to derived, well, not, yes, but you will not get virtual function dispatch at runtime. So you will then call the base class method. It depends on whether the compiler sees the derived class at compile time or not. This is the difference. Okay. If the compiler sees the actual derived type at compile time, use this. If it doesn't, if you want runtime polymorphism, you use virtual functions. Okay. Recursive lambdas. Um, how do you um, write a recursive lambda? Can you write a recursive lambda? Let's try this with um, factorial, which is the canonical example for a recursive function. Don't actually implement factorial like this, but it's a great toy example. So let's try and write factorial as a recursive lambda. So Obviously, everybody, I guess, knows the formula for this. Uh, it calls itself. Uh, is this going to compile? No. It's not going to compile uh, because it has this, uh, you're going to get this error um, saying that, well, you're calling f within its own initializer. You cannot do that, right? So you have uh, uh, auto f, so it needs to deduce the type from the initializer, but then you call f in the initializer, which is the body of the lambda. So in body of the lambda, there's no way to refer to the lambda itself. This is, this is just not going to compile. Okay? How are we going to get around this? Well, we could add a std function instead. right? So we can write std function and then catch that by reference. And then we can call f in the body of the lambda. But it's not great, because it's an additional object, std function. You get type erasure. You get like an additional level of indirection. You get a heap allocation. You get all of this extra stuff. Uh, so, so it's not great. Well, what we can do is we can, we, we cannot refer to the lambda itself inside the lambda, right? The f, but we can template on the function that you want to call recursively, right? So we can we can we can pass it as a first parameter. This compiles in C plus plus twenty. Unfortunately, we now have to call this function with this weird, in this weird way where we need to pass it to itself in order for this to work, right? Because it doesn't know which function it is that it's going to recurse on. So it need, you need to tell it that it should recurse on itself. With using this, it becomes much, much simpler. Uh, you can just write this auto self, and then it's going to be the type of that lambda. And so then um, everything just works. So that's cool. You, would, you might ask yourself, this is kind of a toy example, right? Where would this come up in real life? But actually, 
Ben Dean in his talk, um, uh, deducing risk patterns, gave like a really interesting example. Uh, so this is a binary tree, and you want to traverse the tree, and you want to count the leaves. Right, so and we implement the tree as, um, as um, a variant of leaf and node. And we have now this, this kind of overload set here, um, which basically is just a bunch of lambdas, and we're going to call that overload set on, on, the, um, on the variant. So we have the std visit, and it's going to call the lambda that takes a leaf if it's a leaf, and the lambda that takes a node if it's a node. Um, so if it's a leaf, we just say it's one leaf. If it's a node, we need to recurse, right? And then we need to add the number of the leaves on the left plus the number of the leaves on the right because it's a binary tree, right? So what we do is we just call the object itself recursively here by doing this, deducing this trick. Um, and this just works. And, and because deducing this is going to deduce the most derived type as far as it's known at compile time, this call to visit self here is not going to call this lambda, but it's actually going to call the whole overload thing because that's inheriting from it. So that's the most derived class, right? So it's going to call the whole um, overload thingy uh, recursively. So I think that's a really cool uh, example. This is something if next time you apply for a C++ job and somebody asks you to do, you know, uh, implement binary tree traversal in C++, you can do this and you can really impress them. But I hope you have a current compiler because otherwise it's not going to compile. So as of right now, the only compiler that already implements it using this is the Microsoft compiler. But hopefully GCC and Clang are going to do that soon as well. All right, second part of the talk, um, std expected. Std expected is um, also a paper that has been in development for quite a while. Uh, it's been through 12 revisions. Uh, the first revision is from 2016. The idea actually goes back to a uh, talk um, by Andre Alexandrescu from 2012. So all these features I'm talking about today, they kind of have been in development for a long time. And um, so it's expected as a tool for error handling. And I think the reason why it's so important is that error handling is one of those cross-cutting cross concerns where everybody needs to deal with it. Um, when you start a project, you kind of have to figure out how, to, how you're going to do error handling. And there are many ways to do it, and they all have different trade-offs. And countless talks have been given on this topic. I think even at this conference, we had topics on, on error handling. This is one of my favorite talks on this topic, Phil Nash. He, talks for 90 minutes about error handling. He's looking at something like 10 different ways to get an error out of a function. He gives a scorecard of, for each of one based on overhead, safety, noise, code separation, reasonability, composability, information about the error you can propagate. It's, it's worth watching. It's a good talk. I don't have that much time today, so I'm just going to scratch the surface and tell you how it's expected kind of fits into this and why it's so awesome. So here's a simple example. We are uh, going to implement a lexer for JavaScript, let's say. And so we have a uh, string view string, which is like some code that we need to lex and then parse. And then this function just parses uh, numbers, right? So you get a string representation of a number, and you need to get a double out. Because in JavaScript, everything is floating point. Uh, we just need to pass the string and make it into a double. We don't implement everything by hand. We actually have a function in the standard library that's doing this for us. It's called stirtod. Never heard about this. Now you have. So what we do is we let the stirtot pass the string, give us the double, and then we kind of just um, advance the begin pointer of the string view so it's going to point past, past like the, the part of the string that contains the number so then other functions can keep parsing other stuff. And in the end, we return, return the double. And so this on the right-hand side is now the client code. We pass it some code, which is the string, and then we want to parse the number. And obviously, the code is not a number. It's something else, so you know, you would like to get some error handling here. Um, what is this going to print, or what's this going to do if we don't have any error handling? So stitch there toward, yeah, prints print zero. If it fails, it just prints zero. So it doesn't distinguish between there's an actual zero in the string and this is not a number. So we need to add some error handling here, right? And so the kind of default mechanism to do this in C++ is exceptions, right? Exceptions are great. Uh, so we can do this. We can say, OK, if stirtot failed to parse the thingy, it's not going to advance the begin pointer. So now we know it failed. We can throw an error in valid character. There's potentially another error. You know, the number is too big. It doesn't fit into double. 
Um, so this is this kind of special return value that you get, so you can throw on that as well. And now on the right-hand side, we have the choice, right? We can either not do anything about it, and then the, you know, you're gonna get stack unwinding, and it's gonna be caught somewhere else, or we can do a try-catch block there um, and catch the error there, right? And it is, this is good stuff, right? Um, exceptions have very good properties, like, um, for example, um, it's a separate communication channel, right? So, so it doesn't pollute the function signature or like the function call or anything. So it's a completely separate like catch block where all the error handling is, is, um, is, is being done. Um, and then um, again, like if you don't handle it there, it can be propagated up the stack. You can get all the stack unwinding and everything. So that's a great option if it's a critical error that happens rarely, right? So, and we need to stop what we're doing and say, okay, stop. You know, we need to try something else. Uh, but in this case, it's probably not what we want to do, right? Because it's not a critical error. It's probably something that's going to happen very, very often. Um, it's easy to recover from. So, um, you know, we do han handle it right here in the, in the, in the catch um, block. Um, but sometimes exceptions are not the right thing to do because the happy path, um, if you don't get an exception, it has pretty much no overhead on run runtime uh, on, on most modern platforms, but the sad path typically has quite significant overhead, right? Because you need to do all this extra work to do the stack unwinding, uh, which we don't need here. And also, it has this non-deterministic uh, execution time, so you can't use it in a low latency environment. It also, it's gonna add stuff into your binary uh, you know, to do the stack unwinding, so if you're in a constrained system, you want the binary to be small. That's also not good. And that's why community surveys consistently show that about 50% of C++ developers work on a code base that actually doesn't use exceptions. So what, others, what other options do we have? We can uh, use return codes. We can, we can use an error code, right? So uh, then it's good. We can do the error handling right there. Um, it doesn't look too bad on the right-hand side. Um, this is, can be good for like non-critical errors uh, because uh, we kind of got rid of all the performance overhead here. It's very efficient, but unfortunately, now the signature of the function looks like this. Like the error handling completely takes over the kind of communication channel which we normally use for uh, the return value, right? And now the extra return value is like this ugly in-out parameter, which is the second parameter. So, you know, this makes the code ugly and, and kind of hard to, hard to read, and it has, it has some drawbacks. So, in CSS 17, we got std optional, uh, which is great. It's great for things that can either be there or not be there. Um, and it's good if why it's not there, it's either obvious or it's unimportant. But it's not a great error handling mechanism because if we return an optional, we do get a reasonable function signature and the code looks clean, but when we handle the error, we lost all the information about what, what's the error, right? We, can, we only say, okay, there's no double number there, but there's no way to propagate what the error, what the error actually was, and maybe we want to display that to the user. And that's where std expected comes in. So um, std expected looks very, very similar to std optional, uh, but it's, it's better because std optional is essentially a value or nothing, but std expected is a value or an error. And you can actually use any type you like as the second template parameter for the error. So it doesn't have to be an exception type. You can have your own custom error type. You can just have a string uh, with like an error message, something like this. Um, so it's very, very generic. And uh, the con there's like implicit conversion from value to expected value error. So the happy path, there's no syntactic overhead. You just return the value. It just converts it to an expected. So it's just like with optional. Uh, there is some syntactic overhead for the sad path, so now if you want to make an error, you actually have to write the std unexpected. And then on the right-hand side where we use this stuff, um, it's very similar to optional, you have a conversion to bool. Um, then if, you know, if there is a value, you can dereference it, um, or you can write dot value, so it's just like optional. Um, no. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not syntactic sugar for tuple. There's a little bit more going on here. Um, if, um, sorry. If, if there is no value, um, we now also get this dot error function, which optional doesn't have, which lets you get the error out. So, so here's an overview over the API. This is kind of the minimum you need to know how to use it. You can construct it um, with just a value, right? And that's, for example, the tuple doesn't do that. Well. 
it does, but like it treats both tuple elements the same. But here, the first one is the value, so you get implicit conversion. The second is an error, so you, you, you need to explicitly construct the error. So it's not symmetric, right? T like the first one is like the default, and the second is the exceptional case. So it's not, it's not symmetric in the way that tuple is. So you can construct the value, you can uh, default construct it, it's gonna construct you a default value if that has a default constructor. In order to construct an error, you have to do the split unexpected, you get um, conversion to bool or a dot has value, you can get the value out by dereferencing, if it's a class, you also get an error operator as well, you can do dot value instead, which is gonna throw um, if there is no value. You can get value or, which means if there is no value, use the one that I supplied. And in addition to what optional has, it also has the dot error, dot error method. Um, how much time do I have? Hmm? 20. Oh, okay, so I'm gonna skip all that stuff here and talk about MD span. Um, so does anybody have any questions about expected? Um, that's not going to compile, I think. You can't have a still expected of T and void, but you can have a still expected of void and error. You can have a still expected void error, that works, but you cannot have a still expected of T void because that's not very useful. Like, right, um, let's talk about std MD span. Um, std MD span, um, it's a paper that has a long list of authors. Um, it's been in development for something like eight years, I think, or even longer. We have one of the authors here in the room, uh, Daisy. Um, and so it's a paper that a lot of people have been working on for a long, long time, and it's, we finally voted it into C++ uh, in July, so this is awesome. Uh, I'm very happy about that. And if you're doing scientific computing or numerics or digital signal processing or graphics or anything else that has to do with number crunching, then this, this paper is a game changer, really. And um, I wanna just go back again to my old days as ast astrophysics uh, researcher and actually even way before then, before I started considering becoming a developer and when I was actually really excited about doing uh, astronomy, uh, the stuff that I was doing was I was working on kind of numerical simulations like this one. So I was simulating the large scale structure of the universe, or rather the institute where I was working at was doing this kind of stuff. And here we're interested kind of in, this, in scales of galaxy clusters and, and bigger, right? So, and the way you do this is you use like a discrete 3D grid. So we, you discretize things like density or velocity on like a 3D grid. And then the universe is infinite, but we can't have an infinite box. So we make a finite box and we have periodic boundary conditions. And then you, you do this discretization and then you basically throw together the equations for hydrodynamics, gravity, and then the expansion of the universe, and then you evolve the whole system and you look at what happens and um, you're interested in whether it looks like um, the stuff that we see on the sky, like the actual galaxies, and if it does, then your model is correct. And if you're doing this kind of stuff, you need a lot of multidimensional arrays, right? So you need 2D arrays, 3D arrays, most commonly actually 4D because you have three spatial dimensions and then uh, the fourth dimension is like the quantity you're looking at. Some of them are gonna be allocated statically, some of them are gonna be allocated dynamically. And this was stuff I was doing before I got into C++. So um, most of that stuff was actually in Fortran. This is the first programming language that I learned when I was studying astrophysics. And in Fortran, arrays, including multidimensional arrays, are a native data type. So they're built into the core language, so it's very, very easy to work with multidimensional arrays in Fortran. Here's how you initialize a 3D array in Fortran. You just declare it, you give it the dimensions, um, and then you can have a loop, and it doesn't really matter what it does, we just you know, initialize them to um, some values. Um, and it's a native data type, right? So uh, you can do stuff like multiply a multidimensional array with a number, and then it's gonna just multiply every element with a number. Or you can just write the whole thing in one statement, and this is something we got now, I think in C++23, we have like formatted output for ranges. Well, Fortran had it in the 60s already. So, um, and if you want to allocate this uh, you know, array dynamically and like your extents are kind of dynamic, then you just say, you just give it these colons, which is placeholder, and then you say allocatable, and then it's gonna put it on the stack. 
uh, sorry, on the heap, right? It's going to allocate it dynamically, and then you can say, well, allocate it with those extents, and um, you don't have to deallocate it. It's all going to happen automatically uh, when it goes out of scope. So Fortran is really nice. And then um, I switched from Fortran to C because I was working with another code base which was written in C. And in C, if the array is on the stack, it looks like this, right? So this is still okay. But then um, if you want to do this dynamically with runtime sizes, the way my supervisor taught me how to do this was this. And this pattern was all over the code base. It was like 100 times like this thing over and over and over and over again repeated. Um, so what's going on here? We are declaring the array as a pointer to pointer to pointer, and then we have to allocate each dimension individually in this like loop, which is really hard to figure out in your head how it goes. Then you do your actual work, and then you have to deallocate it in reverse order, and otherwise you get a memory leak. <sighs> So much later, I actually learned that this, this isn't actually great. This has two problems. Um, a, your array is not going to be contiguous in memory, probably. And B, every element access involves kind of multiple indirections. So a much more efficient way to do this in C is to do it like this, where um, you allocate a 1D array, like one block, which is one malloc. And then you loop over it with 3D indices and just pretend it, it was a 3D array, right? And then you kind of have to get this formula right where you index from your 3D indices, which you have in the loop, to the 1D index, which is the index into the actual array that has the actual data, right? And so um, this is what then I was doing in C. Then I later switched to C++. I was still doing some numeric stuff. And that gets interesting because C++ is cool, right? So we can put it into a class, and we can make it a template and template it on the uh, element type. And then we can uh, hide this formula behind like an operator paren paren, which takes the, like the the three um, indices and, and stuff like this. Who here has written a class like that? Okay, this is half the room. So I've written this at least five times, I think, in my career. It gets really fun when you actually want to template on the number of dimensions and then all your like indices become like parameter packs and everything becomes value templates. And it becomes even more fun if you want it to be const expert because you, need, you know the extents at compile time, so you want to optimize on that. So how do you do that? And it's just really, really, really complicated. And so it's really, really hard to get right. And that's where MBSpan comes in. Because they've basically solved all these, all these problems in this space. And now it's in the standard. So uh, here's like my quick five minute uh, tutorial of um, how MBSpan works. Uh, we again have our block of data, which is this 1D block that we allocate. It doesn't really matter where it comes from. And now we can create an MB span. We can give it a pointer to this data, and we can give it the extents. So we can say, okay, this is a 3D, uh, like a 3D thing, and so we're going to give it the, the extents in 3D. Um, and note that we don't have to write any template arguments. So MD span is a template, but you don't have to write any of this because we have CTAT, class template argument deduction. So MD span uses CTAT in really clever ways to like, figure out what the type is. Um, and once we have our MD span, we can access the elements. And two things are important here. One, MD span is not owning the data. It's just kind of providing a, a kind of view to it, except you can also write. Uh, but it's, it's like this, this thing that we saw before, that we have an array outside, and then MD span is like, lets us index into it. So it's not owning it. Um, and the second important thing is that we now have the syntax with the square bracket operator that takes multiple arguments, which is a core language feature that we added to C++23 basically to enable this, right? So to enable the syntax. Uh, so I think this is really neat new syntax. And because MBSpan doesn't own the data, you can have multiple MBSpans referring to the same data. So you can have a 3D span, MBSpan, you can have a 2D MBSpan looking at the same data as if it was a 2D array. Right? You just need to make sure that it's not going to go out of bounds, right? So you're kind of reshaping, uh, reshaping uh, the kind of the shape in which you look at it. Um, there is this uh, handy member function rank, which tells you how many dimensions you have. Um, and another thing that's really cool is that the MD span constructor is const expert. So if you do know the extents at compile time, uh, you get these great kind of additional optimizations, right? Because you know what the extents are. So um, if you don't, you don't. And you can tell it the extents, um, and you can actually specify them explicitly, and you can even do a mixture of dynamic and static extents. And you can do this by creating a std extents object, 
Uh, and you can tell it, for example, okay, int, that's the index type, so that's important. That's not the element type, so not like the, the values, but it's the, the index type, so it's gonna be some kind of integer. Um, and then we have three dimensions, so we're gonna say the first one is four, the second one is also four elements, and then the third, the last dimension um, is going to be dynamic, so we're gonna give you the size for that at runtime. And then, um, sorry, and then we can create the MB span, give it that extends object, and um, give it the extent for this one dimension which is dynamic, and the MB span constructor is gonna just kind of figure it out. Um, this is the same but written slightly differently. So we again have the um, MB span here, um, but we, exp we, we specify the extends um, as a second template parameter. So this is something else that we can do. We can either pass it at runtime or we can specify it kind of at compile time in the type itself. Uh, we also have um, this case where all our um, extends are dynamic, which is a pretty common case. And if you have that case, we don't have to write Dynamic extent, dynamic extent, dynamic extent. There is this handy uh, type def, which is called the D extends, which means all extends are dynamic, so they are runtime sized, and then we can just give it the number of dimensions, which is three, and that's going to be the same type as, as the one above. So this is actually the full definition of MD span. It actually has four template parameters. The first one is obviously the element type. The second one, as we just saw, is the extends. And the third one is also really interesting. The third one is the layout policy. And what's the layout? The layout is the way we map from the kind of indices that we give the uh, subscript operator to like how do we index into the actual data block. And there's actually different ways to do that. So you might know that there is basically two ways you can loop for to a 2D array to make it easy. Uh, there's row major order, which is how C and C++ do it. And there's column major order, which is what Fortran and, and MATLAB do. And uh, MD span calls them std layout right and std layout left. And in the beginning, I was kind of confused by that. And then I asked Daisy, why do you chose these names? And actually, there's a really good reason for this. Um, if you have row major order, which index is the kind of fastest running one? The one that's going to be contiguous. It's the one on the right. So it's layout right. If you have column major, which one is the fastest running index? the one that's all the way on the left. So it's layout left. So I think it's really clever. Thank you, Daisy, for uh, enlightening me on this. Um, so there's layout right, which is kind of the usual order in C and C++. And you can also, oh, I think oh, this is an old version of the slide. I have some typos there. This is not good. So this should say data 3D dot um, stride. And then it's going to give you the stride. And the stride of the last dimension is one, which means it's contiguous. And then with layout left, uh, data 3D zero dot, data 3D dot stride zero is going to return one, which means that the first dimension, the leftmost one, is the contiguous one. And so then you need to loop it the other way around. You need to like invert the loop to loop through it contiguously, which is really good if you're interfacing with um, uh, Fortran code. Um, but not only do you have these, uh, you also actually can implement your own layout. For example, if you work with images, maybe you want to use some kind of tile layout. If you like, want to work on a portion of, an, of a 2D image, this is maybe the most cost efficient way of indexing into the whole thing. Or There is another mapping, which is the Hilbert curve, which is another way to map a 1D, in, uh, like 1D index into 3D in, uh, 2D or even 3D indices. And actually, this 3D Hilbert curve is something that when I was doing these astrophysical simulations, there was actually a, like, a part of the process where you, you would have to iterate over the whole thing in a, as a 3D Hilbert curve. So that's actually something that we were using. And I wish I had MB span back then because it would have saved me so much time. But um, it didn't exist back then, so I had to write it by hand. Um, I don't have to do that anymore, so thank you very much, authors of MB span. And it actually gets even better because um, not only can you have all these different uh, mappings, but they don't even have to be um, they don't even have to be uh, continuous or they don't even have to be unique. So like two different sets of indices can map to the same data element in the actual data array. And one example for this is um, you have a matrix and you know it's symmetric, right? So you know that the upper and the lower half are going to be the same. So you don't have to store the whole matrix, you only have to store the upper half or the lower half. 
and that's going to save you almost half the memory. And then whenever your indices are indexing into the upper half, you just kind of redirect them into the lower half, right? And so I went ahead and actually said, okay, can I figure out how to um, write a layout and plug it into MD Span in such a way that this works? And I sat down basically just with the paper and um, like the reference implementation that's online. And it took me about an hour to figure this out. So it's not black magic, actually. It's, it's reasonable. It's, it's really quite, I wouldn't say super easy, but it's, it's doable. So this is what I came up with. This hasn't been through code review yet, so maybe, Daisy, you can tell me if I did this right. Um, so this is just for a 2D uh, symmetric matrix. So I just said, OK, the rank needs to be 2. Um, and then uh, there was this constructor where it takes the extents, and I just need to check that uh, width and height are the same, so it's like a, a square matrix because otherwise it doesn't work. And then I have this operator paren paren, and that's the actual mapping. So this is where I put the formula in, and that's the magic formula that's going to map two indices somewhere in the matrix to like an actual data element in the lower half of the matrix. And yeah, there is a little bit more, um, so I need to tell it the required span size, which is like how much storage like, is needed to store this, which is now not n times n, but it's n times n plus 1 over 2. So it's half, more or less, than that. And then there's these other kind of functions. I need to tell it whether it's unique, whether it's contiguous. Um, if you want everything to do everything by the book, there's a little bit more you can do. You can add, like, equality operator and copy constructor and assignment operator and blah, blah, blah. And I didn't actually have to do any of this. This compiled and ran with my test code as it is. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, this, this I thought was actually really nice. I can just plug this in and MD span is just gonna, it's just gonna work with this. So that's the third template argument. There is actually uh, a fourth template argument uh, which is um, the accessor and this is uh, how you access the element. And this is also really interesting. So the default accessor is gonna return a reference to the element, uh, but you can do more interesting stuff there. For example, you can do an atomic ref if you want to like, access the elements you know, atomically from multiple threads or whatever. So you can uh, customize this thing as well. This is super powerful, super extendable. I'm very excited about this being in the standard. If you want to know more about NBSpan, here's a talk by Bryce. Um, he goes into a lot more detail about all of this. Um, and um, yeah, I hope that there's going to be more talks about it in the future. And I have, I think, five minutes left, so I'm just going to very, very quickly cover the last topic, which is the print. And that's literally changing the world, mainly, um, namely, namely, it changes how you write Hello World, which is a pretty important thing. <laughs> um, so this is the paper. The author is Viktor Sverevich. He also also working on it for quite a while. If you open any kind of programming book about C++, typically the first code snippet in there will be Hello World. This is Bjarne's programming language, C++ programming language book, which this is the first snippet of code in that book. It's Hello World. If I take my IDE and say, new project, you know, create me a new C++ executable, I'm going to get this, which is, again, Hello World. This is like just the default. It's a little bit different. It gives me a std endle instead of backslash n. It, it says return zero, which is not really necessary if it's the main. Let's just ignore those two issues for a bit and just look at, at just go back to Bjarne's version here and, and let's do a code review here. What's the, what's, what's the problem here with this? So first of one is performance. Stuts you out is pretty slow. Um, printf is a lot faster, but then again, printf isn't safe, right? So printf, if you give it a format string and if you don't give it the right arguments, you, can, you get crashes or you get security vulnerabilities and stuff like this. Um, so the interface is, the interface is also quite awkward, right? So you have this left shift operator, and then uh, you get this zoo of like I/O manipulators. For example, if you if you want to print a bool, what what is that going to print? One. One. Yes. What you need to do if you want it to print true? Std bool alpha. Exactly. So I bet that not everybody remembers this. Um, and also the other thing is like there's a lot of them, some of them are actually, this is going to compile because it's a header I.O. stream, some of them like std set w, which you need to set the field with, are actually in another header, I.O. manip, so you kind of have to remember that. That's not the worst part though, the worst part is this is going to print hello world, this is English. So my mother tongue is actually not English, my mother tongue is Russian, so if I want to say hello world in Russian, what is that going to print? So on Linux and Mac, I think it's, it's going to print the right thing. On Windows, it's going to print this. 
<laughs> and I didn't make this up. This is like I copy pasted it from literally what my other Mac, my other laptop, which is not a Mac, it's a Dell, and what's going on there. And it literally prints this. So it's and not, I didn't make this up. This is literally what's happening. And this, what? It's just because the console doesn't support. Yes, the console doesn't. Well, so the problem is that Cout doesn't care about the encoding, right? And so it just sends, sends the string to the terminal. The terminal is using code page 437, and so that's what you're going to get. Um, and so we kind of solved part of the problem uh, in C20 when we introduced that format, right? So that format is really nice. It's very performant. It handles Unicode correctly. Uh, so it does do the right thing here. It, it prints uh, true by default. Uh, but if you want to print it as one, you have like this nice syntax with the format specifiers. It is safe, right? So unlike printf, if you omit an argument, it's going to give you a hard compile error. And the other thing that's great about the format is that by default, it doesn't use any of the locale stuff. You know how stitz out is going to pull like all the locales in, which is a nightmare if, if you care about binary size uh, or compile times or things like that. So you can opt into locale, but there's, you can do this kind of stuff, but they, you know, it is opt-in. So stitz format is great, but it doesn't really give you a way for us to actually get the string out, right? And if you want to get the string out in C++20, we again have to do this. And this is not great because it's going to allocate a temporary string object, which we don't need. It's going to call operator left shift, which, in, which is a function call that we don't need. Stitzy out performs formatted output on a, on a string that's already formatted. And it's still not going to print the correct characters because Stitzy out still doesn't care about Unicode or formatting or anything like this. And that's where C23 comes in. And C23, you can do this. And this just works. And on Windows, the print will actually say, OK. The source encoding is UTF-8. The execution encoding is UTF-8. You're trying to print it to a terminal that uses UTF-16, so I'm going to convert it for, for you. So it's actually, what it's doing is, um, whether you're writing to a terminal or a file or whatever, you'll get, you're going to get the same glyphs. So the output, whenever possible, is going to be done in a consistent encoding. And it has all the bells and whistles of the format as well, so it has the same syntax, the same format specifiers. So all the benefits of stud format just carry over to stud print, and you get to use all the same stuff, and you can you can write um, you can write stuff to stud out, or if you want to write to a different stream, you can pass the stream as a first argument. There's overloads for that. You can pass stud er, and then you can print to stud er. So it's just absolutely awesome. So as a result, we don't really have to use stud c out anymore because this is just better in every way. And now in C plus twenty three, we have changed hello world. And we actually changed Hello World twice because we also can now import the standard library as a module, so this is now Hello World. And OK, so it still print, like it doesn't print the new line character at the end. You still have to do the backslash n, but we have a thing for that too because we also get still print line. <laughs> right? So now you have both. And I'm actually really, really curious which one of these two is going to establish itself as a new canonical Hello World in C++. I don't know, maybe we can take a Quick show of hands. Who likes the first version more? OK, four people. Who likes the second one more? OK, awesome. So I declare the second one the official new way to write Hello World in C++. And this is how C23 changes the way you write code. Thank you.